That 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 is important. Now, I saw that some of my comments again, like the one what Trotman said, that I had offered to debate. In fact, it was a question that came from someone here who said, ask me whether I would debate. And I said, yes, individually and collectively. I didn't say, come here to the press conference and say, I want to debate somebody. It was a question here. And so I saw Mr. Ram Karan, who pathologically hates me too, because he thinks that I played the role in played a role in him not being the presidential candidate of the PVP at Ramatar. I supported Ramatar. So for three years he's been he has been criticizing me. Not only him, but all the others. I didn't say a word. So to stay relevant again, and some people need to want to stay relevant. He, I saw he deliberately distorted what I said. Now, let me make it clear about Ch Chetty Jagan and the BBB. If you read my statement, I made it clear that Chetty Jagan's integrity, and I, can, I give you a section, I re read it out to you a little bit later, what I said. His integrity is above board. That Chetty Jagan is a person of high moral standard. So I saw the criticisms that came from, I think, Chetty Jagan's daughter. And if I felt also, if I, I, I tried to put myself in her position, if I felt someone had criticized my father and disparaged him, I'd probably say the same thing or even worse that, that she said. I'd probably be even harsher. But the, on the mischief was started by Ralph Ram Koran. And I think the reason why Ralph Ramkaran is a little concerned to, uh, has been doing that, as I said before, he wants to stay relevant. Because he knows I've been asking questions recently. Because those who try to present themselves as the conscience of the PPP must ensure that they're pure and lily white. And Ram Karan is far from pure or lily white. In fact, there are, you've seen the expose, and I am very disappointed that the media would not follow this up. This is a scandal, a fraud of international proportion. It involves at least four CARI CARICOM jurisdictions. It involves a, um, the police investigations across the Caribbean. It involves money laundering investigations. And so I'm wondering how far in Guyana have we gone with investigating? Maybe the commissioner of police will tell us um, this and the financial intelligence unit should tell us how far they've gone with investigating this fraud. fraud. Now, apart from that, there is another case in the court where Ramjatan is the lawyer for the daughter. And I think Nigel Hughes represents Ralph Rampara on the other side. And again, in that case, because I can't speak too much about that, that is in our courts already, but again, 
a fraud of massive proportion that I believe it to be. But I, that is out of respect for the judge and the court. I will not say much about that. Now, if we, if we go down this route, because the Ram Karan believes that we must cover this up. We must cover this up. And I hope that, that the courts, given that he's a political commentator, that he has been writing extensively, would not allow him to hide behind injunctions to prevent people writing about it, talking about it, and investigating it. Because some of the political commentators, they can disparage and say all kinds of bad things about other people. But as soon as their, their dirty linen hits the, hits, hit, hits the public, they go to the court to try to seek an injunction to block people from writing about it. So I hope that the courts will take into consideration that he's a political commentator. And trust me, when this matter is investigated fully, you will see why some of the reasons why he hates us so much that we will not cover it up. We will not cover this up. In fact, we will speak out about it. So uh, I don't, I expect that some of these people will keep coming after me. Ramkaran and the others. Some of them have an obsession with me, like, like as I said before, two, two engagements after three years, and they say, I want to dominate this campaign. Two engagements in three years, a speech and a press conference, and suddenly, every, because you know, Donald Ramatar has spoken about police reform. That's where they should focus on because he's spoken about response time in the police, the emergency line, more people patrols, a whole range of issues, comprehensive approach to improving policing, improving the image of policing, the reaction time that police take from the time they receive a call to the time you, they, they arrive there. He's spoken about sugar, he's spoken about the rice industry, about job creation. Why don't they want to focus on these things? They're not gonna focus on those. So we have one presidential candidate, one prime ministerial candidate. I am part of a team and my party wanted me to be a part of that team. So it's not for the AFC and the others to tell me I shouldn't be. In fact, I received some envoys over the last three, four months to say, you should be a statesman. Stay out of the race. And don't get involved in these elections because um, you know you should you have a different role to play. But the same people who say that, some of the same people been been criticizing me for three years. I didn't say anything. In fact, Granger said he will I could have interpreted that as a threat to my life. He would put me far away or something like that. He would put me, send Jack there far away. Now sending far away has many connotations. I think I received, I was in, abroad in, in Russia or Malaysia or somewhere when I received a no, um, text from a Marcel Fowler. Uh, yeah, Marcel Fowler. You? Yes, yes. A text from her saying Granger said he would do this, put you far away or something of that sort. I could have in, interpreted that as a threat to my life. He could say all these things about me. And when, when we respond, he gets worked up. But again, they don't want to face their record. We have a clear record. You're going to see our manifesto soon. We can explain where we're taking the country in the future, so uh, in every sector. And, um, and we're prepared to compete aggressively across the country. But there are some dangerous things afoot, particularly the latest twist in this saga about challenging the list. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. No, sir. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Kiana Wilbur, Kaiser News. Sir, you spoke at length about the record of Mr. Greenwich. Um, I just want to bring you to the present. Yes. At any point in time, did you ask the finance minister to face his record as it relates to the IFMA systems not being fully implemented, the abuses of the contingencies fund, abuses of the consolidated fund, the public procurement commission not being established after seven years, non-implementation, no prosecution of the AML yeah. bill, and if I should say lastly I'm on my list, our um, Auditor General's report is actually the thickest when you compare statistically with what with the other reports of the Caribbean um, region as well as with the. You got to you got to go back there. No no no. Just let me so I can I can go through all of the issues. You want AML um, uh, Auditor General I report. At, um, I list the non-implementation of all of the phases of the IFMAS program the abuses of the contingencies fund, which is documented, um, consolidated funds, um, the non-establishment the non of the Public Procurement Commission. Okay, all right, I, I, I got those, yeah, I got all them. You One question, those? since oh. you've, you've gone through all of those, the answer will take a long time, so I'm just allowing you one question. This one here. Um, Let's, let's start with the Public Procurement Commission. The Public Procurement Commission is one of several commissions, six commissions that we established in the new constitution. And that new constitution is, when they talk about change, that constitution which was passed under the PPP is one of the most progressive in the world constitution. It has five rights commission. It has a procurement commission. It gives even these commissions the powers of sanction over the executive, which happens rarely in other work, parts of the world. It establishes four sex standing sectoral committee. Then we establish a, a fifth one on, on security, but on foreign affairs, on economic services, social services, etc. It then allows Parliament a say in the appointment of all these service commissions, the judicial service, public service, police service, etc. It reduced the powers of the president, put in term limits. One of the most comprehensive constitutions in the world and changes. Progressive. The commission, for you to have a commission in place, we can't do like in the past. It, you have to have agreement with both sides. The government, Donald Ramatar, can tomorrow morning, like in the past, cannot go and say, I will establish the Public Procurement Commission. He cannot do that because you require agreement. And like with so many things else, we don't have agreement on issues surrounding parliament. So take for example, the two top posts in the country. In the past, before this constitution, the president had to consult with the leader of the opposition. And then once the consultations are completed, then he appoints the leader of the, the, the chancellor of the judiciary and the chief justice. We change the consult word to agree the result of it is that for the past maybe 10 years, 12 years, we have had the two top posts in our judiciary without security of tenure because the opposition will not agree. Will not agree. So what about that? What about them agreeing to the president's choice for the chancellor and the chief justice? It is a lot of things have changed. So the Public Procurement Commission is different than the Procurement um, Board. What we did along with that, 
we passed the most comprehensive procurement legislation, which is within the purview of the executive. It doesn't require opposition agreement. That, that public, the, the legislation I mentioned before, replaced four pages from 1920 something, 28 I think, another three pages from the 1950s, and a few ST, Secretary to the Treasury, decisions from the 70s. That, is the fr that was the framework for procurement in Guyana. We replaced it with a comprehensive act. That act gave the, it says that we have to tender in every case, excepting if it's proprietary goods. Secondly, that once there is a, the, you have a vetting process, that the bid must go to the lowest responsive tenderer, the price, lowest responsive. So you have to test for capacity, and then the bid must go. It defines how, how it should work. That if the, the bidders are not satisfied with the results, they have the right of appeal. We say establish an appeal procedure. If they're not satisfied with that, they can go to the courts. Fourth, that the information there will have to be announced and published. Fifth, we took the cabinet out of the award of contracts. That was in when I was there, the cabinet out of the award of contract and gave it a no objection rule. The cabinet doesn't award any contracts anymore, approved contracts. If the cabinet disagrees with the recommendation from the central tender board, which is a technical body, it, will, it must say why. It needs to write them and say why. And it cannot say, well, we don't agree with number one, give it to number two. It has to send it back to the tender board with an explanation. In the past, the cabinet could have done anything. That is what we changed surrounding procurement. So in spite of the fact the Public Procurement Commission was not established, we made significant, because of the, the fighting at the parliament, we made significant changes to the environment for public procurement today. That's the first one. I, I can, no, I, I'm, I'm just starting. And the AML, how could you ask us this question? The money laundering bill, I see the opposition says, one of their first act when they, or if they win power, is to pass the money anti-money laundering bill. Now, what version of this bill they're going to pass? Because we presented to the parliament a version of the bill that is FATF compliant, that is CFATF compliant, that they did not vote on. We got advice from abroad, we made, we put that, the recommendations, we changed we, we put inserted those recommendations. We took it to Parliament. So, are they? What version will they pass? Because if they pass any other version than the one that we took to Parliament, we'd still still be in the same trouble. So they will like their mile of fall again. It was true vindictiveness, and there there are others who think that they may <coughs> have been induced not to pass this bill because by, by characters who don't want a strong bill of that nature to, to succeed in this country. And so they will now come back and pass a bill that they made such a big hullabaloo about. Big hullabaloo about. So they, it is the, the worst thing. Now, we need to do more prosecutions. You're right about that, that the prosecutions should should be done more of that. But I know that it's from when I was there that there was a lot of sharing of information across jurisdictions about financial issues. So the findings in the banking system, etc. Can't, can't see more. The Auditor General reports are this thick, you said. And in other countries, they are this thick. 
Now, the thing is that what is important for me, if, if it's thick, then it means maybe it's better, it's more comprehensive, because this is a tool. We see this as a tool. The Auditor General has been unleashed. They had a muzzle. Then we took off the muzzle by extending the powers of the Audit Office. We took off the muzzle by allowing them to report directly to Parliament. We, the office has had more resources. So if they go now and they find more problems, say they find an accounting officer who didn't, um, who didn't do something right, then we want it to be there. We want it to go into the audit report so that it becomes a tool for us. Because you don't expect the ministers or the permanent secretaries to be auditors to every day to find out what's going on. You can have a lot of, lot of problems or fraud. And it's only when you do audits that you really find out. But one of the explanations for the t t volume, the size of the volume, is that when I was there, we had pro complaints by the accounting officers for the government agencies. They claim that when they give their explanations, the Auditor General finds something, ostensibly find fraud. And they, so they will send that to the audit, like a management letter, send it to the accounting officer. The accounting officer then responds to say, this is not so. There is a, a, a perfectly, legitimate, perfectly legitimate explanation for this. That many times their explanations do not get into the final report, but the allegation is there. So we insisted that they attach to the audit report, I don't know if it's been done now, the explanations from the accounting officers. So when the Public Accounts Committee is chaired by the opposition, that they will see both the audit report and then they will see the detailed explanation of the accounting officers. So if it's not reflected accurately in the audit report, then they can make their own judgment. This is why what we had required. I don't know if that is one of the reasons why it might be this huge now. So, but, but that is something that we had. If mass, I thought everybody would be happy with if mass. We did a comprehensive, all with the view of ensuring greater accountability. So we changed our laws, we moved to program budgeting so that people now have to put their money, not just in a line item, but in a program, so you can account for results, and you can see which program is successful and which is not. We move to program budgeting. We then move the, to a revenue authority. We had customs reporting to the Public Service Commission. We moved to a revenue authority. So that's on the revenue side. And on the expenditure side, we moved the program budgeting. So then we said we needed an automated system to trace all transactions, which used to be manual. So sometimes you needed, in the early days, 28 entries to complete one transaction. So we said, how can it be simplified, yet, yet, um, maintaining the, the integrity of the process. Today, almost all government expenditure, in fact, all government expenditure goes through IFMAS and it's recorded. We have several modules. There may be one module that still has problems because of, of data, etc. But 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 we have had five or six modules that have been implemented. And I think if you, if you go into the Ministry of Finance today and say, how much money was dispersed to the Ministry of Health? They can just, they don't need to search your paper. They can then go to the computer and find it immediately 
how much was dispersed, what it was dispersed for, etc. It is a huge improvement. Now the treasury functions, do we need to improve on treasury function? This is a constant improvement. At one time, we wanted to go with the New Zealand model. We're a totally radical model. And, and then we realized that we were auto. When we, even with the IFMAS, the early years, we didn't look enough at the design, so we automated processes that were unnecessary. So rather than had a conceptual look at it and simplify it and then automate it without losing the probity and integrity of the system, we automated some of the old processes. So it was like running a uh, old thing on a new engine, an old vehicle on a new engine, which was subsequently changed. Lots of changes have been made. Now let's let's go to abuse of the contingency fund. She, she asked me, I gotta answer the questions. If you ask me the questions, I'm going to answer questions. Abuse of the contingency fund. Yes, um, I, I, I just no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm answering when I'm done answering because I don't want anybody to say I'm not giving answers to questions that you've asked. You ask the questions, I'm responding. So if I don't know about the abuse of the contingency fund. As far as I have seen, that there have been specific rulings from the courts when the opposition claim that there has been an abuse of the contingency fund. There's been one ruling recently, but in the last three years, and every time they've gone to the court, the court said the, or the, the finance minister has acted properly. There's been one ruling recently as it relates to because of the, the issue of no budget and stuff like that. So there is that one ruling. But the Minister of Finance has tremendous powers under the Act. You don't expect the Minister to stop paying wages and salaries across the public service if, if um, because there's a law of necessity. If the opposition doesn't approve money for appropriate money for wages and salaries, should they shut down the whole public sector? They, I think the law and the act allows him to do this. And the doctrine of necessity allows him to do that, to make sure people are paid, that people are paid. So I don't see major abuses. Um, Maybe I shouldn't go on too much. Let me give a Sir, couple I'm of other. No, but we'll clear. come back to you a little bit later. Let me Dennis, give Dennis. Dennis. Yeah. Um, Mr. Fabio, how do you reconcile your your position or your comment earlier in the opening statement that uh, Mr. Winter says he wants to basically get rid of some categories of foreign investors? Um, those are my words. Oh, yeah, what well, to me? He did go on to say that he's not against foreign investment. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, what your comments about Mr. Dr. Jagger's integrity and, and honesty and so on, is this an attempt to repair your, what you would have said earlier about his lifestyle and his house and so on? Are you trying to back it? Um, because there is, in the first case, there, that, there was never an issue of me questioning his integrity. So why would I have to backpedal on an issue where I never question his integrity? And I know that that is the thing that the hostile media would want to focus on. And I don't mind, because I can, I can take that stuff. And I'll come back at it over and over again to hide Granger from the key issues. But I never mentioned that, never question it, and so there is no need to backpedal because there was no question about his integrity and his and he, him being corrupt or his his uh, commitment to the cause. There was absolutely no question in my mind when I spoke about that. I said it was distorted, and that if I had not been here in this country, the daughter doesn't live here. And I myself had read Ram Karan's article. I would have probably reacted even worse than her. 
that is what I'm saying, that if you read his article, and I'm saying also for the, that Ram Karan did that because he has an axe to grind. That is what I'm saying. So it, I, I do not need to backpedal because there was no questioning of his integrity. I'd be the last person to do that. Chedi Jagan, when I was a, appointed me as minister in my 20s, Chedi Jagan, I traveled with him, with just the two of us alone, to many countries. I've seen him, I know of his integrity, I've worked with him. He took me into the executive of this party, not the central committee of the party, when I had not even contested the elections for the central committee. Because he asked the central committee to include, include me here. And so I know working closely with him. I've traveled with him many, many times. I'd be the last person to ever question Jagan's commitment to cause his integrity or anything of this sort. So anything has to be, anything of that sort that comes up has to be in people's head, that Ramkaran Ram Karan head, or it has to be sinister. What's the, oh, oh, Granger. Yes. Said, oh, Granger, yeah, well, that well, well then why did he single out? Why did he have to single out? Why couldn't he say that I'm not opposed to, to investments, but I want to have a second look at the investing investment framework about these people who are in the resource sector. He singled out these, com um, these countries, Chinese, Brazilians, Indians, Russians, four of the five BRIC countries. I don't, I don't know if we have any South African company here, but he singled out these four countries. He could have, when we have also investment agreements with oil companies that are not North American companies, she should want to have a look at everything. All of this. Uh, he, no, I said, did I? No, 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 I said he. Yeah, well, I didn't. Did I say it? What? Oh, but, but that is, don't, that, that's not a, an issue. He, 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 should, Mr. Granger. Mr. Granger. So, 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 maybe it's because I'm, like thirsty and, uh, and dehydrated. <laughs> could, could, could the Congress afford a 13% uh, salary increase for government employees as has been counted by the Senate? 13? 13, 13 is an unlucky number, <laughs> Nagamutu. I don't know where Nagamutu comes up with this. Ask Nagamutu how much, what will 13% mean in dollar stock? You want to bet if you ask him now. He could go and find out now. But if you call him and say, what does this mean? How much would it mean in dollars, Doc? He wouldn't know. He wouldn't know how much it is as a percentage of GDP. He wouldn't know what fraction of the um, deficit it is, the budget deficit. He just plucks these numbers from his head. He's a rabble rouser. Robert Rauter, nothing on policy. Compare him policy-wise with Elizabeth Harper. You compare who would you want to put the affairs of this country in the hands of? A person, when, when you're going to make decisions like Elizabeth Harper you're or, lobbying, you're lobbying. or Nagamutu. I'm not lobbying, I'm talking about our candidate who I, 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 I have great respect and admiration for. I've worked with her, seen her in negotiations. She's led the foreign ministry for, for years. She's been part of negotiations and the e economic partnership agreement. Tons of negotiations, the, bi the bilateral commission. She has her hands on the pulse of the country. Who would you want to? to put your, your, your future in, your hands in the future. Now, Ramatar and, and Harpo, or Granger and Nagamoto. We have said whether we can afford it, whether the country can afford the, the thing is that I'm not going to even give Nagamoto any serious consideration. I will speak about Nagamoto on the platform, maybe tomorrow. 
You'll hear me talk about yeah. this story in this episode. Sir, I don't know respond news. In your opening statement, you spoke of no auditing of privatization proceeds. Mm -hmm. Is the same thing continuing, for example, in the case of Nissel? We don't know how much money Nissel has. There is no control over its spending. And if I could slip into this, you spoke of Greenwich's $4 million house um, four months or five months after he came into the office, his transport. But then, sir, during your tenure, and I can attest to actually providing you the information, there was a transport for Lionel Wordsworth house that he bought in Bel Air Park for $60 million, and at the time, his wife was earning a salary of $40,000. Greenwich, at the time, was earning a salary of $28,000 in 92. Who is Wordsworth? The Wordsworth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, The whole question of corruption. Yeah. Do you expect me here to know how many public servants are there? <laughs> No, no, no. The, how I many agree. houses and what about uh, do I know if uh, words work? I don't have a clue. This word word finances. Word word is not my friend. He is not a colleague of mine. He is not a minister of the government. He heads a project. What if, do you expect us to know? How would I know if he borrowed the money? No, no, no. I know. But, but, I uh, but no, no, no. You I don't know sure. because you just try to to deflect the issue from Greenwich by pointing out to a junior person in the government that we can't rebut here because we don't know much about him. So, but here is the Minister of Finance who is responsible for all financial matters in the country. Ghana stores at that time, most likely through the Public Corporation Secretariat, fell under the Ministry of Finance. Government property transferred to him in a prime area for four million dollars in the in January of 1993, four months uh, transferred to him as minister, minister of finance, four months after he had demitted office. Doesn't this bother you, Adam? It, it does. does. Well, I hope that that's the case. You can do in your paper the comparison with Wordsworth, no. but do not try to deflect not the, the deflect seriousness it, of what. A man who was entrusted yeah. with the finances of this country, transferring to himself, without, I'm sure that you will not find a public procurement process there. Sir, but I brought this issue to you while you were president. But I know there were lots of issues that you might have brought, and I might have sent it somewhere else. I don't, I don't even recall that, because there are lots of things I don't recall that get, gets published in the Kaicho News too. How I own um, own some airline and all kinds of stuff. You, Big, you didn't say that, Adam. You did not say I own an airline. No, sir. Did you put an ad that ran for four weeks? How I had sabotaged some airline coming to Guyana, and every week they put a little slot here, and then they, you remember that? You remember and that I owned it with some some guy from abroad. A bunch of lies. I didn't even respond. To. I, I didn't respond. Three years, a bunch of lies, and I don't respond. And you're coming here to ask me about right. deflecting from there. I'm taking three more questions. Kaicho, yes. you are No, no, no. Those from different media houses. I got two from Kaicho already. No, no, no. Okay, you didn't answer the Nissel question. Oh, no, Nissel. Winston Brassington has spoken a hundred times on the Nissel accounts. The Nissel accounts are up to date as far as I know. The Nissel accounts are up to date. I could, why do you keep saying that Nissel it doesn't, is not accountable? Nissel accounts are up to date. Anyhow, okay, yeah. Uh, Marcel Thomas, um, Taking you to the Greenwich argument with Adam, uh, my question is, uh, as it pertains to you, are you, Dr. Javier, prepared to justify how you were able to acquire your first home on a presidential salary um, on the background or backdrop that you had said at you didn't have much money to give to the then Mrs. Jackie, if I'm correct. That's one. And you spoke of of sugar also. And um, 
what it is for show workers and all of that. But I don't know much about, about sugar, but um, from research, there is you, you they have you promising eh, to personally intervene for, for the sugar workers to, to, to say, yes, you saying that you will personally intervene. At the day, yes, because, the, because of the failing um, production. You had it going from 250 tons to 350 tons per hour. Um, per hour? Well, the other way around. From 350 to The dropping. I'm no, no, no. What for the personal intervention? I don't yes, understand no, that. Yes, 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 if, if, if this fails, if the modernization of the sugar um, development oh, program oh, fails, yeah, yeah. I bargain that they will yeah. intervene. Personally personal. intervene. But how would you then? Yes, yes. How would you then, in essence, fail those persons that you said that you would have intervened for because the date you have to not? Yeah. Well, maybe I should have intervened a bit, bit more. <laughs> but let me let me make it clear that sugar is a challenge. Clearly. Skeleton has problems and needs skeleton needs to be fixed. The board, the board at that time made a decision to go with a particular contractor. They, we had Tate and Lyle to be the project manager. Tate and Lyle. So we had a top-notch company to be the project manager to ensure the quality of the work because Jadir could not decide on design specs and all of that. We needed Tate and Tate and Lyle. Tate and Lyle was the project manager troll. We have had issues particularly with the the pump dump that was sourced out of Miami, etc. So there are specific issues that need fixing. We sought to fix these things from time to time. I did try as president to fix those things, to initiate meetings, etc. Clearly, we still have to fix some of them because the factory is not running the way it should run. And it has, has potential to do much more. But sugar's problem is much more complex. The Belize went out of sugar. Uh, go, go, well, problems with Belize. Jamaica scaled back. Barbados went out of sugar. Trinidad and Tobago went out of sugar. St. Kitts, if you recall, came out of sugar. Because our cost of production still high. And we still have the challenge with the cut in the European Union prices by about 36% which led to us earning about 40 million US less per annum for the industry. So that is a major problem. It is the market and the price at which we receive sugar. What do we do? Do we say, let's get out of sugar? If we get out of sugar, like the opposition wanted to, if we get out, the entire Barbies region, not just the sugar workers, but the shopkeepers, the taxi drivers, almost everyone, because it's the biggest thing in the economy here in Barbies. It will affect everyone. So we have to find a way. We don't have a choice, but to find a way to make sugar work. There are some key things that we have problems with. Labor, sometimes not enough labor. So mechanization can help to solve that. Clearly, our fields have not. So it's not just the factory, because Skelton is one factory. The fields are not that productive. So we need new varieties, as the president spoke about this already, and you know, increase productivity of the field. We need to make sure that the other factories, that we invest in the other factories, so that they too can become efficient. We need to fix Skelton, as I said before. 
we need to move to maybe a distillery and refinery. The president spoke about this already to broaden the sources of income for sugar because we can't just do from the sale of sugar. So if you ask me yet, have we managed to fix Kalen? No, we have not fixed it as yet. We need to fix it. But it's a crucial part of the recovery process in the industry. And we are prepared to work on it to support the industry like we did in the bauxite communities. Up to now, we're supporting the bauxite communities with billions of dollars of electricity subsidy. Billions of dollars every year of electricity subsidy. We don't hear much about that. So we are prepared to work to fix sugar because sugar is not just about burbies. It's about the economy. Sugar is still a big contributor to the economy, still big source of foreign currency earnings, still big source of jobs. It's not something that you dissolve only in, in, in teacups. My, my thing, yes, I am prepared, but not to the Starbuck News or anyone else. I am prepared to do that because that's what I said. If people earn their money honestly, why should they be worried about living in any, or, or building a nice house? They, I see they speak about the size of my pension and the size of my salary. It was Christopher Ram comparing it with somebody else. But why, when it was the same for Otto Chung. Why wasn't it a problem? Otto Chung got seven eighths of, of my salary when I was president. I'm getting seven eighths of Ramatara's salary. Do you, do you know how much it is? You know, right? It is, it is about 1.5 million. Do you know that Granger collects about $600,000 a month? And Granger said that for eight months Ramatar, eight months Ramatar didn't hold the parliament. And for eight months he collected his salary from the parliament at $600,000 a month. Five, Five eight is something, Adam. Don't try to make the I'm twenty thousand. Okay. All thing. right, you know it. I'm glad that you know it. You never published it, though. And uh, the conditions, the other conditions of service that Granger has, the security and the payment for his office and a ton of other things and medical benefits too. You didn't, you don't publish those things. So I served twelve years as president. I served twelve years as president. A, per, a person who served five days can get the same conditions that I'm getting. The attorney general makes the same salary like the president, and I get 70 eighths of that as my pension. It's not something I took for myself. It was always 70 eighths of that, the president's salary, or the, the, the 70 eighths of your salary. It's not something I took. But when you think it's only a judge makes maybe about a million dollars a month, yes. I, 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 the chancellor of the judiciary makes about the same same money as the president, the same money as the president. So it is not; it's these posts that hold this. Thing. So I am, um, and then then I earn other money too. I earn a lot. So so no, no. Let's move on now. Yes, please. Two other questions, but different media houses. Yes. All right, Hannah Donka, THGP Nightly News. Um, Mr. Jaguar, can you please provide some clarifications um, of the Ghana dollar? When we look at the Ghana dollar back then and the Ghana dollar now, how we really trade it, um, maybe against the US dollar. The other thing um, you said when Granger and Nagamutu heads to head to uh, Burbies over the weekend, that they should talk about what happened in 1973. Would you talk about what happened back in 2002 under this very government? We had several young black men and so on disappearing without an inquiry coming from this government to provide explanation to mothers and so on who might be going out and vote. You know, they might want some explanation yes. what's happening. And also, if Ram Karan was still a member of this party, um, would he be provided any um, cover, any, co any cover up? Who would have we been seeing? No, I, I the last one no, not from my <laughs> side. No, the last one no, absolutely not. Um, you you talk about 1973. It's not like I want to go to 73. But what I said, listen carefully. Listen, I heard. Yeah, listen, I said, Granger. In 2015, is say, 2015, 
that elections were never rigged in this country. Contrary to fact, to reality, to what everyone knows. I'm saying he's either doing this for two reasons, that he's out of touch with reality, or he is, it's a falsehood, he's lying. So when they go to win, 10 miles down from Wim is a place, is a village in 1973 where two young men tried to prevent the stealing of the ballot boxes and they were killed. And Granger was in the army at that time. And so could they tell the people in Barbies and Wim when he stands on this platform if he still believes that elections were not rigged, because if he maintains that, he's saying that those two, the, the, the two persons who were killed. Three. A police was killed, but you never mentioned it. Okay, okay, well, that's better. Yes, I'm glad that you mentioned three. <laughs> I'm glad Adam Harris is <laughs> perfectly right. So that three people were killed, and it was around the ballot box. One was a policeman. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so. So that is what I'm saying. Now that's a, a reasonable thing. It's not like I'm going back to 73, etc. I'm saying tell the people in Wim. Now, what was the second question? <laughs> I, 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 oh yes, yes. Yeah, we, I don't know, I would say to people, anytime we want a comprehensive inquiry into what happened, we should do it once and for all what happened to not not just young black kids but any kid who get killed we should have an inquiry into everything maybe let's start <clears throat> the mother of all inquiries let's start from how the guns disappeared were given to the pnc to 150 guns, and how they ended up in the hands of the criminals in 2004. That, and the same period you're talking about, how they ended up in the hands of criminals in 2004. That Granger still doesn't want to help us get back those guns. So, so that's one. Let's, let's go to, to Buxton. Let's see about all the policemen who were killed and let's find out about who brought weapons from Suriname and gave it to the criminals here. Okay, let's, let's do that. Let us examine all the charges of extrajudicial killing in the country. Every single charge of extrajudicial killing by Phantom Squad, by any other squad. Let us do, let us do, well we did the Linden. The Linden is already done because, but again, there were charges too here that didn't really substantiate, but we can do redo in there. Let's do one, one comprehensive inquiry and into everything, violence around elections, when people were beaten and their buildings burnt and who started this, let's do that too. Let's look at any case of violence in an inquiry. Let's bring in some foreigners. If we, we don't, don't satisfy. Sarsaw too? Yes, Sarsaw. Let's go with Sarsaw. Because, yes, and Agricola and, and Partica. Let us do every everything. I, I'm, I'm all for that. Some people want to pick and choose. A little bit here, a little bit there. We should do one thing. Maybe if, if we... We can propose it to Ramatar after he becomes the next president when he gets reelected. Re no. The guy in the uh, door. Yeah. No. Uh, the guy in the door is an answer to Oh, yes. Yeah. The guy in the door. But lots of things. When I go to US dollars, I look at the size of the economy, three bi 300 million then, it's 3 billion US dollars now. That, that is what I, I often look at. And look at the inflation rates, the rate of inflation. Bernard spoke extensively about inflation here, triple digit inflation. We have had in the past, what, 15 years or so single-digit inflation. 
Kurt Campbell okay. news source. Um, Mr. Jack, yeah. you just want to play about Kurt Campbell news yeah. source. Yes, and you want to? Gordon Mosley. Oh, oh, Gordon Mosley. I want to take you back quickly to the first question I was asked okay. actually, because you spoke extensively. But I wanted to clarify if you are saying, in essence, that Ms. Dr. Singh's um, record as Minister of Finance is spotless, and what, what do you feel of this performance over the years? Okay. I, I think Ashni Singh is a bright young man. I think um, he has done a great job as Minister of Finance. And I think that he's been uh, the subject of a vicious campaign by several persons because they can't get their way of, of shutting down the country. Because effectively, what they tried to do was to shut down the country so that people couldn't be paid, um, there would be funding for many, many programs, etc. And because it so happened that he's the Minister of Finance, had it been any other person, they would have gone after him. They have made this about an accountability issue, rather about procedures. And so you have, when you have disagreement over procedures, you go to the courts, the courts interpret the issue. But they made it look like Ashni Singh stole the money. So every time you hear them speak about sending Ashni Singh to jail, the police have made it clear that, that if you think that he's breached procedures, that's a civil thing. There's no criminal liability or anything of that sort. And I do not think he's breached any civil law. But they have made it look like Ashni Singh is a thief. And he is not. He is a person with great integrity. They do that as a campaign to make PPP people look that way. The campaign. I'll ask two questions. No, no. We're from Kaichor? No, two from Kaichor. No, he is the editor of Kaichor. He is the editor of Kaichor. I'm also from Kaichor. Oh, no, no, no. My question is very short. No, anyone else, I give Kaichor News two. One. Two. Oh, Adam yeah. Harris is from Kaichur News, and this yeah. young lady is from Kaichur. I gave, yeah. Anyone else? Chronicle. 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 Yes. Chronicle. Chronicle. Yes. Chronicle. Chronicle. Yeah. Chronicle. Chronicle. Dr. Ali, you talked about corruption, and you say um, the allegations against the UP is that they facilitate corruption. But well, what is your, your, your position on the perception of corruption at certain levels? It does exist. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and it was quite pleasing to me that the Vanderbilt study went beyond the traditional transparency international measurement of perceptions of corruption. If you have a chance to look at that Vanderbilt study, which is part financed by the US government, in fact, we had a presentation done to us with the US um, charge um, present at that meeting. And they sought to measure two things, the perception of corruption and also the experience of corruption. Because sometimes when you measure the two, you get very different results. So what they found that the, the experience of corruption was different than the perception of corruption. They moved away from this transparency thing where they just come and talk to a few people. They did a comprehensive survey, one of the most detailed surveys I've seen. Not transparency comes in and they, uh, they spend a couple of days and then they go off on the basis of perception. But the experience of corruption was much lower. And what was interesting to me is that I look at where people said was the most corruption. And 80% of the people so we had said three levels. The municipal level, which is local government, not just, in our case, it's the local government system, local organs, police, and the courts. 80% of the corruption, the experience of corruption, came from those three sources. So it is very interesting. So we are looking at policy-wise what could be done in these areas, you heard the president speak already about the police, a comprehensive speech to the police, talking about response time and, and corruption and all of that. So to look at what at these three levels we can do. So 
this study was very interesting to me because the experience, people, the perception could be very different than the experience. When they ask, have you experienced a case? And people say, no, but I hear, hear from Kaichou News or somewhere else. So that's it. Thank you very much. Good.